I now give the floor to the first speaker of this morning, Yvonne Donders. Yvonne Donders is a professor of international human rights and cultural diversity, head of the Department of International and European Public Law at the Faculty of Law, University of Amsterdam. She has been uh, uh, working as a, in, in the UNESCO uh, headquarters in Paris, uh, and she's still consultant for UNESCO for uh, the Office of the Air Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, Geneva. She's currently chair of the advisory board of the Shelter City Initiative and also chair of the steering committee of the Netherlands Network for Human Rights Research. She's a member of the advisory board of the Netherlands Institute for Human Rights and uh, also um, a member of the Human Rights Committee and the Advisory Council on International Affairs uh, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands. Her research interests uh, include uh, public international law, international human rights law, in particular economic, social and cultural rights, uh, the implementation policies of uh, international instruments uh, at the national levels and so on. She has many publications, is a very you know, uh, well-known uh, uh, scholar in this field. So I'm very happy to give her the floor. First of all, thank you very much for this introduction. Thank you very much to the University of Padova for inviting me and also the partners in this project for having me and also giving me the opportunity to share some of my thoughts, ideas and experiences from the Shelter City program in the Netherlands. This is what the Shelter City program looks like and I would like to talk to you today, first of all, about what Shelter City actually is, also perhaps what it isn't, and also a bit about the personal experience that I had in selecting human rights defenders for the Shelter City program. Now, just to make a little bit of publicity, but also for those of you who are interested in perhaps creating a Shelter City yourselves or perhaps supporting one more extensively, and I'm very, very pleased to hear that actually Padova is also going to be a shelter city. I just wanted to briefly show you what they are. Because shelter city is actually about real people. And that is something that we tend to forget. This is what it looks like. And here are the stories of all these people that we have hosted in the Netherlands, some visual, some unvisual. But just to give you an idea on, it's really all about human beings. And that sometimes creates a bit of a challenge with the cities who have different ambitions and different interests in hosting this program. But from my part of the whole project, I always emphasize it's these people that we're actually doing this for. Now let us go back to the presentation. So first of all, who is a human rights defender? Because shelter cities are about hosting, supporting human rights defenders. So first of all, I think a bit of clarity on what a human rights defender actually is would be helpful. Now, as was already mentioned this morning, it's not only the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but also the 20th anniversary of the Declaration on Human Rights Defenders. Now, that declaration is actually called the Declaration on the Rights, Right and Responsibility of Individuals, Groups and Organs of Society to Promote and Protect Universally Recognized Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. Now, that, of course, is a typical UN formulation of something relatively easy in a complicated way. So, therefore, we tend to call this the Declaration on Human Rights Defenders. And that declaration defines human rights defenders as such. Individuals, groups and associations contributing to the effective elimination of all violations of human rights and fundamental freedoms of peoples and individuals. Now, this sounds like a very broad group of people that potentially could be a human rights defender. <coughs> Other terms, however, are also consistently being used. Human rights activists, human rights supporters, human rights organizations. 
Nowadays, however, especially in the UN circles, as well as in the European Union circles, human rights defenders is the term that is used. The EU, the, uh, the uh, European Union, has actually developed its own policy on human rights defenders. It has really picked up this resolution and over the years tried to come up with its own policies and supporting ways of supporting the human rights defenders. <coughs> Amongst others, there are EU guidelines on human rights defenders adopted in 2004 that actually define human rights defenders in a slightly, in my view, more positive way. Namely, individuals, groups and organs of society that promote and protect universally recognized human rights and fundamental freedoms. So it's no longer only about combating um, violations. It's more about promoting and preventing violations, perhaps also from happening. Broadly speaking, everybody who works on, for and with human rights could be seen as a human rights defender. I guess most of us in this room consider ourselves, to a large extent, a human rights defender. So, which type of people are we actually talking about? It's persons, it's persons within organizations and it's organizations also as such. Human rights defenders can be women and men of all ages, they can be young, they can be very old, and from all sorts of professional and other backgrounds. They work at different levels, international, regional, national, local levels, and they basically most of the time work in a non-governmental setting. However, the definitions, as I've just shown you, do not exclude that also people working in a governmental setting can be called or can be seen as human rights defenders. Also, people in the private sector, even businessmen perhaps, can be potentially a human rights defender. Normally, human rights defenders work to promote and protect the rights of certain vulnerable or disadvantaged groups. For instance, the promotion of the rights of women, LGBTI people, persons with disability, <coughs> laborers, workers, children, etc. Normally, or most of them, indeed have a particular target group. And their area of work, however, can also be from different angles. They can be targeting the media, they can be journalists, or bloggers, or floggers. They can do it from the perspective of law, lawyers, judges, other legal experts. They do it from the perspective of education, teachers. As I said, I think looking at my own job, teaching human rights is also part of being a human rights defender. And of course, we also should not underestimate the area of health. There's lots of doctors and nurses that actually take human rights strongly on board in everything that they do. Human rights defenders may be paid for their human rights work, but it can also be a voluntary thing. So in other words, if we take this broadness, this enormous variety of potential human rights defenders, it becomes on the one hand, very inclusive. It's a very inclusive way of defining them. But it also becomes sometimes a bit difficult to identify them. And that is because, of course, they're in such a variety of areas of work, but most importantly because a lot of human rights defenders do not want to call themselves a human rights defender, because that brings them into more danger. It's better to say that you're a health worker or that you're a teacher, instead of calling yourself a human rights defender. Because once again, that gives you a label that may actually harm your work, make it more difficult, or actually target you for even persecution. Bringing you more at risk is really not what human rights defenders want, so again, they are creative in finding the right label for their work. Now, human rights defenders have a double, I would say, use of human rights. 
Of course, they're mostly about protecting the rights of others. But they use themselves, of course, human rights a lot to do so. And thereby, by doing that type of work, their human rights are often very strongly violated as well. So for instance, they are tortured, they are harassed, they are arrested, some are even killed. They are prevented from expressing themselves. They're prevented from providing information. They are prevented from associating, from moving, going inside the country or even outside the country. Often their right to a fair trial is denied. Their access to justice is denied. And also their right to education and their right to health. So interestingly, the reason that human rights defenders' rights should be protected is actually to enable them to protect the rights of others. To enable them by doing their job well, to enable them to protect the rights of those disadvantaged groups of children, of people with disabilities, of LGBTI. So again, human rights is all what human rights defenders are all about. They play a crucial and necessary role in respecting and protecting or defending the human rights and fundamental freedoms of others, making use of their own human rights. And that is what makes it a rather complex thing to find them, to first have their own rights respected and thereby allowing them to do the same for others. We've heard many stories of the people that we hosted in the Shelter City program. For instance, that they couldn't rent a house anymore because the landlord found out that they were gay or not even gay themselves, but promoting gay rights. People were prevented from going to schools or from taking courses. People were prevented from freedom of expression on the internet. They were constantly blocked or their, their settings were cut off all of a sudden. But also, they were prevented from access to justice. We've heard many stories where human rights defenders either defended themselves or defended the rights of, for instance, uh, women whose rights were violated. They went to courts, nobody wanted to hear them. They went to the police, nobody wanted to hear them. And that's a form of injustice and impunity that sustains this situation so long already. Now, the idea to defend the human rights defenders came, of course, with this declaration. And as I said, it was picked up in the European Union and thereby in different countries from the European Union. So as I said, there were EU guidelines on human rights defenders and they gave the first hint in 2004 of what was expected from the member states actually to do. Namely, provide measures for swift assistance and protection to human rights defenders in danger in third countries, such as, where appropriate, issuing emergency visas facilitating temporary shelter in the EU member states. This was the starting point where the European Parliament called upon the member states to say, let's do something and provide them with this temporary shelter. And this is where the whole idea and the whole project of Shelter City came from. It was further laid down in a resolution by the European Parliament in 2010. You see that these processes tend to be rather slow. It takes six years to move from some guidelines to a concrete resolution in the Parliament. In the meantime, in the United Nations also important developments were taking place, such as the creation of a special rapporteur on human rights defenders in 2000. And also interestingly, and not many people are aware of that, also at regional level in Africa and Latin America, there are special rapporteurs on human rights defenders. This European Parliament resolution was picked up in the Netherlands, in the Dutch Parliament, in 2010. 
<coughs> and it called upon the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to follow up with this initiative. And this is something, I will get back to it in the, in the end. It's interesting to see that the Shelter City project, and also in this guidelines, it's linked to foreign policy. It's not so much linked to the cities as we may see it internally, but it's really part of, as it says here, human rights defenders in danger in third countries. And also in the Netherlands, it was connected to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It was a foreign policy thing. So, indeed, in 2012, the city of The Hague which already labels, of course, itself as city of peace and justice with all the international legal institutions and other UN agencies. That city took up the initiative and said, okay, we will, with the help of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, create the Shelter City Initiative. The Hague thereby became the first shelter city in the Netherlands and hosted a pilot project of four human rights defenders that were hosted in The Hague for a period of two to three months. Not all at the same time, but one at the time. Now that project was very positively evaluated by all sides. The human rights defenders were very pleased, The Hague City was very pleased, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was very pleased because they supported it also financially. So it was decided to expand continue the project and expand it. Netherlands Shelter City project is still mostly financed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as well as, of course, by the hosting city itself, which provides support and also all kinds of facilities in kind. And again, I cannot emphasize enough, this is still part of our foreign policy, mostly. Now, the project has grown, has expanded enormously, um, which brought all kinds of complications. But now we have all these cities that actually participate. Amsterdam, Deventer, some of them will be less known to you, I guess. Groningen, Haarlem, Maastricht, Middelburg, um, Nijmegen, The Hague, Tilburg, Utrecht and Zwolle. And there's even more cities coming. So from 2010 to 2018, this has become a major project. And also what the project has been doing is try to find partners also willing to establish a shelter city. So Tbilisi has now a sort of a hub, Dar es Salaam and San Jose, and as we just heard from Professor Masha, also <coughs> Padova is going to be a shelter city. Now, what does a shelter city actually do? What do we do with these people that come to the Netherlands to be in one of these cities? But before we do look at that, how do we select the people that can come? Now, this is where my role comes in. We, um, the, the project is, as I said, financed by the ministry, but it's organized by an NGO, Justice and Peace. Justitia et Pax also for uh, others, because it's an international human rights NGO. They host the project and they organize the practical sides with the cities. But they wanted an independent selection committee to do the selection of the shelter city candidates. And I was honored to be the chair of that committee, or I still am, <laughs> since the very beginning. Now when we started in The Hague in 2010, <coughs> We had about 20 files, from which we could select four, so that took us a couple of hours, was not too difficult. Nowadays, we get hundreds, hundreds of files, hundreds of applications, I should say, and of course we then select one or two per city. It depends a bit how often the city wants to receive a person. The task has become incredibly difficult. It's also one of the most difficult things I do in my life, selecting people for this. Let me give you the formal criteria with which we work. The committee is composed of a representative of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, 
Not because the ministry wants actually to have influence on the process. They may want to, but they don't get that. But because we do have important issues of visa, for instance. So we need indeed the connection with the ministry and the embassies to make sure that those visas are actually given. If there's sometimes problems with visa, we better know before we invite somebody. There's two or three members from different human rights NGOs, from HIVOS, from COC, which is the LGBTI organization, and Free Press Unlimited. Because most, as I said, of the human rights defenders come from the journalism side, the LGBTI side, uh, or any other kind of development and human rights issues. So those are also helping us in selecting the candidates. So the formal criteria. First of all, you have to be a human rights defender. Oh, I am already just explained how difficult that is, or actually how broad, or maybe therefore how easy it is. But we do emphasize that people should really have a human rights angle in their work. You have, for instance, sometimes environmental defenders or environmental organizations that purely work for the environment without having a human rights approach. So normally we try to have that strong human rights approach in their work. You have to be under a serious threat or heavy pressure in your home country. And that is, of course, where the trouble begins. Because every file contains horrific stories of people fighting for human rights and being harassed, persecuted, threatened every single day. So from those hundreds of files, we first have to see, okay, are these threats serious? Are the threats real? But guess what? Who am I sitting in The Hague in an office together with some colleagues with all good intentions that we have on the basis of a piece of paper to decide how bad it is. Again, I find that one of the most difficult things to do. You end up comparing the seriousness of threats. Everybody is threatened, but then we say, hmm, but that is more urgent or more serious than others. And it's sad than to say to others, sorry, you're not eligible for this program. Simply because we cannot host more than we can in these cities. But to define how bad it is for some person on the basis of a piece of paper is quite difficult. Of course, we try to get more information apart from the application from the applicant, him or herself. We get information from our embassies, from partner NGOs, from people working in those areas to see, do you know that person? Do you know the organization? Have you worked with them? Because unfortunately, that's the other side of the story, there are now, I would say, false applications. There are people that are drafting applications being paid to do so. So sometimes if you put several together, you see exactly the same text coming up. It's like applying for EU funding. There's bureaus popping up everywhere to help you with that for lots of money. Unfortunately, that's also what's happening with these type of programs. People are, are that it's fraud, it's really fraud. So we try to get those things out of there by inf asking for more information. The third criteria is also a very clear one, but a very difficult one. The ministry, of course, wants to ensure that this does not become an asylum procedure or a hidden asylum procedure, by which people enter the country with, an, with a visa and then actually decide to stay. Now, as a human rights professor, I've told them many times that everybody has the right to ask for asylum. That's also in the Universal Declaration. So I keep on telling them we cannot prevent that. Because when people are here and they're all in a situation where you would say, logical that that person may ask for asylum because they're human rights defenders, seriously threatened, etc. Criteria that normally are very much linked to asylum policies. However, I also understand that, of course, this should not become such a program because then the support from the ministry, the support from the cities will be diminishing. And that's also not what we want to have. So once again, how do you know if somebody wants to go back? Well, you look for clues. Once again, it's, it's, 
it's really bizarre in your head if you do that. So for instance, oh, that person has a family still back home. So probably that person will go back. Or, well, he, has, he or she has a job there, a paid job. So most likely that person will go back. But it's part of our negotiations and it's, as I said, really, really hard. From the more positive side, we also look at what are possible activities that that person can do in the Netherlands. Is there a network that is relevant for that person? Do we have connections with partner organizations that can help this person? Is there any kind of, well, social network that we can invoke for this person? And of course, we always ask the person to what extent that person wants to become public. Many of them, as you also have seen from the website, are actually not visible on the site. And even their names are sometimes not their full or real names. Because as we know nowadays, everybody can be followed through the internet. It's not very difficult. And sometimes it's actually very dangerous for a person to leave the country and then go back. Sometimes it's better, but sometimes it is worse. And also, um, family members who stay behind might be threatened and harassed. So again, that full picture that we need to have in order to select the people. <coughs> then we come up with those kind of people. We host them. Mostly, I also have to say, there's an English language barrier. Most of the cities can only host people that speak English. Uh, the Hague and some others sometimes accept people that speak French. But for instance, people that only speak Spanish, Russian, Chinese, or anything else, again, that's a limit to our program as well. Whereas at the same time, we're very aware that this limits the amount of countries and the amount of people that we actually can, uh, can host. What do they do? What are the goals of the shelter city? First of all, to provide rest and respite. Rest from your work, the burden of always looking over your shoulder in order to see if you're safe. In the Netherlands, they can be safe, they are safe, they can have a bit of peace and quiet. So to provide shelter and literally protection. And that protection can, can sometimes go quite far. Because as you know, some governments do not stop at borders harassing people. So some of the cities really had to take measures in order to truly protect that person. Secondly, build the capacity in the network of the human rights defender. They get training, for instance, security training. With your phone, with your laptop, with all electronic devices, they get special security training. They get network training. They get advocacy training, fundraising training, anything that is available either in the city or in the Organization of Justice and Peace. They also join together for human rights trainings, so from all the different cities they join together. They also try to build a network. A network is important for your protection as well. For instance, we bring them into contact with politicians of our own parliament, but also of the European parliament. So when they go back, and something is happening, they may be able to contact that person who may put political pressure on anybody that, can, that is actually harassing them. So that network of international politicians or experts is important for them as a sort of safety net to a certain extent. These are, what we, these are two things, or a, sort of a summary of the things that we offer them. But what is in it for the cities? Because of course, it has to be a two-way street to a certain extent. And therefore, we should not be naive. This is not only about us doing very good. This is of course doing good, but it's really also to strengthen the image, that's what the ministry has also been saying, of the Netherlands as a human rights champion. Now we can discuss that also during coffee breaks and lunches, whether the Netherlands still is a human rights champion, but that was the idea. The idea to show to the outside world, see, we're doing this project, this is good, we are promoting human rights with this. And I'm not saying that that's wrong. Absolutely not. It is taxpayers' money. I mean, you have to have a good goal for that. 
And if that goal is to promote a bit your own policy, so be it. <coughs> also, the cities that came in and wanted to participate also said, we want to strengthen our image as human rights cities. Now, we will discuss also in the afternoon, and we have already in the morning heard about it, the whole concept of human rights cities, what that means. Now, for some of the cities in the Netherlands, it means to have such a program, very concrete, it's, it's clear that you host a person for a couple of months as a human rights defender. And they do so also to strengthen the involvement and the, to raise awareness of the citizens about human rights. Most of the human rights defenders go to schools to tell their story in, at local level, go to universities. I had one in one of my human rights courses last week telling about the situation in the DRC in Congo violence against women and the way this lawyer, he happened to be a lawyer, tried to protect and promote the rights of women in his region. So they do that kind of things. They go to the municipal councils to tell them their stories, to talk about human rights. Very impressive. So indeed, that does raise awareness in the city about at least those human rights and these people. So what you indeed see happening is that the municipality and local organizations tend to come together around this project. Many universities participate, uh, schools participate, local NGOs, human rights or environmental or, or development NGOs participate in the, the project as such, together with the municipalities, with the local governments. And that has indeed created kind of a human rights atmosphere amongst them. The local media are very often closely involved, reporting on the people, sometimes with names, with photos, sometimes without, but the story can be told, even without a name. The story of how that, pe how that person has worked, what he or she is doing, and how they end up in one of the cities in the Netherlands. It does, therefore, very importantly, raise awareness about human rights in the city. But I would like to end with two thoughts, critiques if you may say, and I'm not critiquing my own project, I'm, I'm too happy that that actually got off the ground well, but I do understand that there is some, how would I say, sensitive issues about this project. First of all, as I said, the emphasis on foreign policy may create, in my view, the very false expectation that human rights are over there. Human rights is in all these countries far away where all these very you know, important human rights defenders are there and we host them here. As if everything is wonderful in our own cities and that is not the case. So again, it should not take away our ambition, our visibility of the own city and what is happening in there. If you look at what is happening in all of these cities, in terms of, indeed, as was mentioned by Kuhn, migration, in terms of housing policies, health policies, cities are increasingly being asked to take up a lot of responsibilities in the social field, for instance. We see poverty in our cities, very present. So I'm just warning that this type of project cannot be sort of taking the attention away from the also inside. The citizens themselves also have human rights and we cannot buy that off by supporting somebody from far away. Human rights are not only in, third world, in, in the third world or in third countries as the EU was also promoting with this policy. That's why I found it understandable but unfortunate that even the European Parliament put it very much as a foreign policy thing. I think it should be part of your internal policy as well. These cannot be unconnected. You cannot only promote human rights far away without looking at yourself. And I think that Shelter City could do that, but it should be strengthened more. I see a lot of, I hear a lot of people involved in it talking about it as if it's far away. Secondly, and that is something I truly find difficult, is that some of the citizens in municipalities, but also municipal leaders, 
have said, well, is it all worth it? Is it worth to support one person for a couple months? We also need to spend maybe indeed that money on supporting 20, 30, 40 people in our own city. We have issues in our own city and indeed we're only supporting that one person that goes back after a couple of months. And that is, I think, a discussion we need to undertake. Why does this, what does this do? And is it indeed in good balance with your local policies? Does it fit? Now, I think where it does fit is what we said this morning and what this whole conference is about, connecting the global and the local. That's where this fits in. It cannot replace your local policies on human rights. It should not replace that. It should not give citizens the feeling that indeed we're supporting kind of external people abroad without looking at the plight of these people in, in terms of housing, in terms of healthcare, in terms of social security. However, hosting one of those people, it's not a fortune that you have to spend on that. And I think it's well spent if indeed you connect that person to your local community as well. Because seeing somebody doing a presentation in schools, it does raise a lot of awareness, much more than we can do ourselves. I saw it last week. I do the course on human rights. I tell my human rights law stories, but I think the person who was there last week from the Human Rights Defender, he was making much more impression than I ever could. But it's the combination. It's the combination of connecting that global and local. So yes, you support one person. And yes, that costs money that of course can be spent on anything else. But if you do it properly, if you do it well, then indeed it can have a very important added value. And let's then go back to where I started. They do need our shelters as well. These people, the project has now hosted almost 80 human rights defenders from more than 40 countries. We will reach the 100 next year. And all of them have given us the idea that this is indeed an important thing for them. Most important indeed when they go back, they also train others. There's a flywheel effect, as we say. They train others. They come back with new energy, with new networks, with new ideas. <coughs> and training and helping others in promoting human rights. Now again, that needs to be done by connecting the global and the local. I thank you very much for your attention.